Welcome back to another episode of Nerd Tween and Movie Podcast. I am your host, Nerdpool Prime. Thank you again for joining me today. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover. We're going to be doing a full, and I mean a full, breakdown of the newest episode of Loki titled Nexus Event. Um, so that being said, of course, there's going to be spoilers all throughout. Uh, but I would like to start off by saying uh, if you are listening to this on uh, Spotify, iHeart, Anywhere you get your podcast, besides Apple, I'm still waiting on them to get me get back to me. Um, or YouTube, please do me a favor, like, share, subscribe. Uh, it really helps out, and I really appreciate it. But that being said, there there's just so much to go over this episode. I felt it necessary to do a scene-by-scene breakdown of what I found. So strap on in. Uh, this will likely be a long one. So if you have not yet seen Loki Episode 4, The Nexus Event, You will need to back out now to avoid any possible spoilers. But since this episode drops uh, Sunday, I think most of you will be good due to the fact that Loki and all of the Marvel content moving forward will be released. uh, Marvel Disney Plus shows, at least, will be released on Wednesdays. So if you're still here, that means that you know what you're about to get into. So let's get going. The episode opens up with a shot of Asgard and a young Sylvie playing with some toys. Playing make believe with dragons and the Valkyrie. In comes Rovana the Renslayer back when she was just a hunter. They arrest a child version of Sylvie. Now, what still has me questioning, even after numerous watch throughs, if the Loki from Avengers is the TVA approved Loki, and there's no alternate timelines due to the fact that we have the sacred timeline, then how did it take so long for her to commit a time a crime against the sacred timeline shouldn't the second she was born as she says later in the episode the goddess of mischief been the nexus event should should have been the first clue now this should have been the first clue for the big reveal later in the episode um but more on that later also we see that her hair was black uh when she was a child which means she is which this is the final nail in the coffin that states that she is no that 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 whole she's not a Loki but Enchantress theory, which I kind of also thought because there has never been a blonde Loki in my knowledge, so that closes that loophole right there. But there's more concrete proof of, proof of that later. When Sylvie first enters the TVA, she sees someone struggling, screaming, and and she says, "Help him." Which seems a bit out of character for a Loki. Now maybe this variation did not have a Thor to overshadow her. uh, So she is more, at least initially, on the side of like a moral good. Um, And then we also learn that she was informed that she was adopted. So she had a much different upbringing than the Loki that we know. Granted, it didn't last very long. Sylvie... um, is run through the same processing as the Loki that we saw in the first episode. The ominous music and the lack of dialogue really changed the feel uh, from me uh, to remember in the first episode, that whole scene where he was getting processed was more of like a comedy. Uh, And this was definitely not a comedy. It was more um, like an anxious horror type vibe to it uh, because of the, uh, Honestly, it's kind of messed up that they grabbed a kid, um, but uh, that that just seems to be their prerogative at this point. Uh, when Renslayer takes Sylvie back, uh, back before the judge, she fights back and bites her and steals the tempad and escapes. In this scene, you can see that Renslayer uh, was Hunter A23, which is most likely an Easter egg reference to the character's first appearance in Avengers number 23 in December of 1965. We see that the open opening scene was a memory of Renslayer, which she recalls before stepping into the Timekeeper's chambers, and we get our first look at the mysterious Timekeepers in the flesh. Or have we? More on that later. Mobius and Renslayer have a heated conversation about the timekeepers that leads to a questionnaire about c20 the hunter that sylvie bewitched to fight her own team in episode 2 the variant mobius referred referenced it's real it's real and he wants to know what that is well i I did all, all all i did was rack my brain trying to figure out what she meant uh granted by the end of this episode um 
all those answers are going to be revealed. But uh, at the time, I, I was just flabbergasted. I couldn't make any heads or tails of it. Renslayer said that he can't speak to C-20 because she's dead. That, after returning to the TVA, she got progressively worse until she could barely speak, and now we and now she is no longer living. Renslayer tells Mobius to keep it quiet to avoid panic, even though you can see that Mobius is beginning to figure something might be a little wrong here. We cut back to Lamentis, and Loki and Sylvia are having a heart-to-heart -heart chat, as the planet is about to be destroyed. She tells him about her first encounter with the Timekeepers, which was what Renslayer was... Um, remembering and she explains this to loki i'm really glad that they didn't have her telling loki and that video montage being like with her with a voiceover uh for that scene it was very it was a lot more impactful um as it was presented but moving on she says the universe wants to break free so it creates chaos like her it also revealed that sylvie actually did figure out the apocalypse just like loki did Sylvie says she grew up at the end of a thousand worlds. Now, that was something that I um, definitely pointed out in previous episodes that how could this variant um, possibly figure that out? And now we know because anytime she went anywhere, it immediately brought the TVA onto her. So when she went to a place where they didn't, that's how she did. She figured it out. It was a process of elimination. When we cut back to the TVA, they are doing all kind, all they can to find Loki, and and the Loki, excuse me, and Hunter B fifteen is clearly agitated, which we'll get into more in a bit. Mobius lies when questioned about C twenty, even though it pained him to do so. Back on Lamentis, we see the impending doom of our Lokis. Sylvie says, "Do you think what makes a Loki a Loki is the fact that we're destined to lose?" Which is a callback to uh, last episode when Sylvie asked, "What makes a Loki a Loki?" Um, and then, of course, in the last episode, our Loki responds with independence, authority, and style. Loki has a very different answer this time. Loki says, no, we may lose, sometimes painfully, but we don't die. We survive. Well, he did watch himself die at the hands of Thanos, so this feels like Loki just trying to say whatever he can to comfort Sylvie. I mean, you did. You would just... A child when the TVA took you, but you nearly took down the organization that claims to govern the orders of time. You did it on your own. You ran rings around them. You're amazing. Pause. So before I say anything else, I have a few things uh, that I need to say about the next bit. I've had a lot of people on social media on all my accounts commenting any range of things about how Loki is by and that it's a problem or this or that. And I already went into detail into this in my last episode. This, however, is about them falling for each other. Think about it. Loki is a vain person who loves himself more than anything and is a literal definition, is the literal definition of a narcissist. So, obviously they would fall for each other? I mean, like, wh why wouldn't they? And what really makes this work is the simple fact that Loki can simultaneously sympathize and empathize with Sylvie. Now, Sylvie, come on, this is probably the first conversation she's had with a person in decades. She thought she, like, at this moment, she thought she was going to die. No more agenda, no more mission, just sharing her last moments with someone who genuinely understands her maybe even better than she does herself. All that being said, in my humble opinion, them falling for each other is not only in line with the characters, but also, for me especially, when the love initially started, which caused the Nexus event, was to both those characters, this was their final moments. So, in your final moments, you have very little reason to lie, very little reason to... Um, try to scheme or, 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 or backstab or anything like that, you especially when you kind of just accept it, uh, as they were literally sitting there watching the doom creep in the horizon, literally. Why would they not form some type of, whether it be romantic or anything like that, just a, a type of love for each other? Because 
they both thought they were going to be alone at the end. Like, they both truly believed that. So they were able to be that other person for the other version of themselves. And honestly, it, it, it fits. And I don't see what the problem is. But, so, all right. So it, it, there, there's a logical connection that that those final moments would grow some kind of connection or a bond. And, and, and let's, let's face it. Loki is willing to turn himself into a female horse, get pregnant, and birth an eight-legged horse to give to his dad. Why would he and she not be totally open for this? Okay? Rant over. Unpause. The stunning imagery that continues to be shown in this ep- in this series um, it is better than, in my opinion, than WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, it, it's just... Granted, they do have a lot more to play with because they can literally go anywhere um, in time and space. So it gives them the ability to just make these crazy landscapes that we're seeing that are just absolutely stunning. Just before the end of the world, we get this great shot of the meteors hitting the planet. And when Sylvie and Loki look at each other in that moment, with almost certain doom on the literal horizon, it is clear that there is something there. When we cut to the TVA, they speak. They see the spike from this event on Lamentis. That Nexus event line felt like a very not subtle uh, reference to something naughty. But moving on, Mobius asks B15 if she's ever seen a spike like that, and she responds no. And, and the way she says it, she's almost terrified. Mobius will explain that later in the episode, by the way. Moving on. I also think there's a connection um, that will come into play later. It it just feels uh, that them holding hands and gazing into each other's eyes sent a spike like that to almost a red line on a world that was going through an apocalypse that should have had zero time variance energy detected. Remember, Loki and Mobius went back to Pompeii, and Loki literally started yelling in Italian about how they were all going to die and said they were from the TVA, from the future, or at least future-y. Um, Could you imagine if they kissed? It would literally fact- fracture the fabric of the universe, at least as we know it at this point in the episode. I do have a nerd tween theory about that, um, and i um, definitely going to get into that later in the episode. But I, I really have – it's hard for me to figure out what the hell is going on, and I bet after all this episode many of you will feel the same way. Um, but it's meant to be that way, uh, and I will try to break down as much as I can to give you the best um, the best answers as your what your questions might be. Uh, and, of course, if you're listening to this and you're watching it on YouTube or, you know, you know my Instagram, just reach out. Um, if you – on YouTube, like I said, just comment. Let me know what you think. And if not, just go ahead and hop on Instagram and, and just send me a message and we can uh, talk about what you thought. So it, it's a really great scene uh, when the TVA bring in both Loki and Sylvie. And, of course, she gets more security, uh, which obviously just – like destroys Loki, because uh, I mean, and, and let's think logically. She literally made it to the outside of the door of the Timekeepers, so of course she'd have more guards. But L- L- Loki was uh, very insulted by that fact. And then you know, Mobius is uh, using this interesting tactic here. He's kind of taunting Loki as he escorts him with two other guards. Um, and I love the back and forth between Mobius and Loki, uh, like mocking Loki would probably hate like Loki would probably hate that so much more than a lot of things if you mock him pardon me let me readjust Mobius says that it occurs to him that Loki is not the god of mischief and then Loki responds with his his funny return with the most polite smack talk I think I've ever heard folksy dopey insult from a folksy dope he continues by saying what am I the god of self-sabotage yeah, the gods of backstabbing? Just, not nah, just kind of an asshole and a bad friend. This is a tactic, uh, sh- like, the feeling, like, you could feel the, like, the, the actual emotion behind the words. So, like, it may have been a tactic, but he definitely meant a lot of what he said there. Mobius began to really come to like Loki, even when he was destroying his salad. Mobius gives him one last chance 
at a trick, and Loki tells the truth. Which, even though Mobius couldn't know it was the truth at the time, it kind of started the, the unraveling of the entire um, TVA, uh, like, motto for him. But moving on. Uh, Loki is thrown in what they call a time prison, where he is um, reliving an event, which we get a very surprise cameo, uh, one that I didn't see coming and one that, honestly, I didn't even have on my radar. So bravo, bravo and brava to everyone who kept that under wraps. Uh, but we got Lady Siv uh, played once again by Jamie Alexander, reprising her role from the Thor movies. She last appeared in a Marvel movie all the way back in Thor Dark World, all the way back in 2013. She did appear, however, on two episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as Lady Sif, but to my knowledge, they're not completely canon. Um, and to be honest, I, I really don't know at this point. Let me take a sip of my tasty beverage. Moving on. In the scene, Sif is mad at Loki for cutting her hair, and this is actually a modern retelling of a classic Norse legend. Um, from my research... In the Legends, Loki cut off all, all of Siv's hair because he wanted to rob Thor of his greatest treasure, which in fact was Siv's hair. Uh, granted, in the Legend, Siv's hair is also golden, but still. This is a memory of when Loki actually cut her hair. The time prison loops her walking up, berating him with some of the harshest words that Loki could, could possibly hear. Uh, conniving, pathetic worm, and then gets slapped in the face and being told... I hope you know you deserve to be alone and you'll always be, always be. Then gets kneed in the nuts and punched in the face. Only for this whole process to start again and again. Now, stop for a second and think. Yes, while Loki is technically a demigod um, and a frost giant, and he's been ragdoll slammed by the Hulk and lived to tell a tale, but, I mean, he does feel pain. And Siv is an Asgardian. And I would even wager at least in the MCU, is one of the more, the stronger of the Asgardians. Those blows have to hurt. Loki even tries to plead with this construct. I mean, he even says that he knows it's a recreation of memory and just, <clears throat> excuse me, like a construct, and he's still trying to reason with it. Mobius tries to get in to see Sylvie, and Renslayer is definitely not having it. She says she's too dangerous. Mobius says that he doesn't think that Loki is the mastermind, and I will say it again, and I think a lot of us are saying it at this point, this is kind of feeling like um, Mephisto all over again, but how is it not Kang? Like, how does he not show up in the show? And I've been saying this for a while now. I always thought that the casting of, of uh, it was Jonathan Majors, um, the guy from um, Lovecraft Country, as Kang in the um, Ant-Man 3 was weird for multiple reasons, one of which being why would you put a villain that prominent first appearing in an Ant-Man movie? Because that, to me, like if that's the, was the plan or is the plan, um, then they're, they're really kind of not wait. I don't want to say wasting the character, but it definitely looks like a, hey, look, come see Ant-Man because Kang's in it. You know what I mean? Type thing. So I think that'd be a misstep. And I really believe that his casting announcement, I mean, because the initial rumor came almost six to eight months, if I'm not mistaken, before the announcement was made. The announcement was only made last year. So why would they have that locked down so much? And mind you, they put this all together, the, the announcements during COVID. They already knew everything was getting pushed back. Ant-Man 3 isn't coming out to 2023. So it definitely makes sense that he would be in something previously. And honestly, I don't know if, he, if I can commit here to say that he's going to be the big villain or anything like that of this uh, season. But... What I am going to say is there's just so many different renditions of that character that they could even potentially bring in a Kang that's just crappy and has him killed. And then the, the casual, you know, the, the, the people who only watch the Marvel movies, they may not know, but we all know that there are 
like uh, almost unlimited amount of Kang spread out across time. So it could easily have another one show up later without having any issue continuity wise. So I, I, I still just think I've, and like I said, I've been saying it for a while. I, I think that Kang's going to show up maybe not as full on like Kang the Conqueror. Um, he, he might show up as just pre Kang. He might show up as Iron Lad. I, I had a, a theory that, Iron Lad shows up like at the end of the um the first season because they've already confirmed second season is in the works. So end of the first season, it all hope seems lost. Then in comes Iron Lad, a version of uh, Kang that didn't want to be evil. So he, he, honestly, it, anything can happen at this point with the way this show's going, and it's been fantastic so far. But I digress. And moving on. Mobius talks to B-15, and he says, We've brought in Kree, Titans, and vampires. Why is it two orphan demigods are such a pain in the ass? And, you know, I I'm pretty sure that this is the first literal mention of vampires in the MCU. Uh, and, of course, that sets the groundwork for Blade and his eventual debut in the MCU. But so the fact that they chose Kree and Titan out of all the things they could have mentioned, I, I would bet that they had to prune quite a few Ronin the Accusers uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy as well as Thanos variants. Um, and just be just just think of how cool it would be to get like even if it's like a, a two second scene of Mobius talking to Thanos. I want that so badly right now. I, I can't even begin to describe it. But moving on. As Mobius walks away, B-15 asks if Loki said anything. And when Mobius says, yeah, that the TVA is lying to him, you can definitely tell that B-15 is going through something and she's trying to put all the pieces together and work it out on her own. Uh, when we cut back to Loki in the time prison, he lit, he's now resolved to begging. He's trying to beg this construct to stop. Um, and he has a true moment of honesty. He says, I get it. I'm a horrible person. A really, I really am. I cut off your hair because I thought it would be funny, and it's not. I crave attention because I'm a narcissist, and I suppose it's because I'm scared of being alone. Another reason why they would fall in love um, and fall for each other, two narcissists who are probably only afraid of ending up alone find themselves on a planet that's about to be destroyed with imminent doom, and they're not alone. Come on. The love story writes itself. That being said, Sif helps him up and says, you are alone and you always will be. As she walks away, the tune of ominous music, which again is an unbelievable um, difference for me in Loki versus Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision. While those other shows did have good music and everything like that, this version is just I, I can't even describe it like the the way that they've used the music whether it be needle drops or an actual score it just makes so much more it just makes each scene feel the way they want you to feel it sets up the actual feelings that they're trying to convey um but this time Mobius arrives and asks if he's ready to talk. Loki comments how they are they are on a loop, you know, repeating encounters with the fancy technology, um, uh, skewed to say the least, um, in, in, uh, interrogation tactics. But at, at this point, Mobius says a lot's changed, which is obviously true. Um, and, and I live for these scenes, Tom Hiddleston, Owen Wilson, just flexing their acting muscle. Kevin Feige said, um, before the show, show even started that they would be a new favorite duo and duo. And he is 100% right. And I, I can't see anybody else in the role of Mobius right now. I, I mean, like, there's something about Owen Wilson that just screams 
like this rebelliously fun time detective. I don't know what it is, but uh, it definitely, definitely um, it is a fit for him. Loki and Mobius go back and forth. Mobius always seems to know just exactly which buttons to push to get the desired reaction from him for the most part. And, and usually honest answers. Mobius grills him about Sylvie. Now remember back, it's all the way back to Thor Dark World. And I know, I don't like doing it either. But Frigga, um, Loki's and Thor's mom, not biological for Loki of course, tells Loki that he's always so perceptive about everyone but himself. And, and this is especially true right now. I mean, look at Loki really didn't even realize that he had feelings for Sylvie. He genuinely never loved anything like that. The love he had for Thor was was buried deep beneath um, just jealousy and admiration. And even, like, his love for his father and mother, like, they straight up, like, he hated his father for most parts. And him and his mother had a very tumultuous relationship at best. Um, she, you know, of course, really loved him and... Uh, Loki just seemed to pretend like he didn't, um, to put up that front like he talked about in the first episode, the, um, uh, cruel trick to, to, to hide all of his fears. So before Mobius gives up and throws Loki back in, into the time prison, Loki pleads for one more chance. Loki tries to make up some BS, like he's this big ringleader, and, and I love the way they framed, <coughs> excuse me, the face-to-face -face shots when Mobius and um, Loki are talking, uh, and they're going back and forth, and he says that, sorry, uh, Sylvie was pruned. It feels like, uh, like when they're talking in this framing it feels like really like almost too close and personal and i think that's uh what they were going for trying to like make you feel their emotion there and then this is what i was talking about earlier when mobius says two variants of the same being especially you forming this kind of sick twisted relationship that's pure chaos that could break reality now, if you watch Loki, you, you will see him showing signs of pure anxiety as Mobius pressed the issue. Now, would it break reality or break reality free from its captors in the TVA, as Sylvie stated? Pure chaos, yeah. And as I said earlier, if, if just holding hands, like seriously, holding hands fondly while looking in each other's eyes had enough time variance energy to literally almost redline imagine what would happen if they kiss i know i've said it before in this episode and i'll say it again that would be a game changer he questions loki about overthrowing the timekeepers and loki accurately says maybe they need to be overthrown and by the end of the episode we'll find out how true that really is Loki finally blurts out that everyone is a variant and that the little and that little earworm got Mobius thinking. Even if he didn't show it at the time, he definitely had some type of uh like, hmm, maybe he's right moment. And as the Minutemen are pulling Loki up to put him back in the time prison, Loki says, "You know, of all the liars in this place, there and there are a great many. You're the biggest." Why? Cuz I lied about your girlfriend. Oh no, that I can respect. I mean the lies you tell yourself. And that was the final straw that started making Mobius really go down that rabbit hole um, of trying to get to the bottom of what of the accusations that Loki is bringing about. B-15 is visibly distraught outside, breathing heavy, uh, before she goes in uh, demanding that to be let into Sylvie's cell. It at first definitely looks like she's going to prune her, you know, or, or at least beat her up. But she instead opens a time door and walks through and motions Sil Sylvie to follow her, and she does. We cut back to Mobius, and he's signing the finalizing paperwork to close the Loki case in Renslayer's office. 
He is visibly distracted, and Renslayer even asks him if he was okay, and they're celebrating with a drink. She asks him if he could go anywhere, anytime, where would it be? Which is an inter interesting question, considering, as Mobius points out, he literally can go anywhere, anytime. She says, you know what I mean, and he just changes the subject and asks about why he couldn't interview Sylvie. And of course, Renslayer's like, who the hell is Sylvie? He doesn't say who the hell, but that's basically what she meant. And also interesting that Mobius chose to say that. He didn't have to call her Sylvie. He just, you know, likes Loki as a friend and kind of just adopted the name as he would hope. Renslayer, Rens, Renslayer blah, 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 plays the same BS she's been doing the entire time, saying she's too dangerous and would have escaped like the first Loki did, our Loki. Also, side note, I really like that they named her Sylvie. Um, one, to throw off so many of, of us scoopers like me, um, because that Sylvia, of, of course, is, is a um, almost a direct reference, if not direct reference, to the second, I believe, Enchantress in the Marvel Comics continuity. Uh, so we all thought she may just be, you know, like an Enchantress, but we now know for sure she's a Loki. Um, but I do like that they gave her a name, so we're not like, Calling her, like, Lady Loki or, or something like that. She's Sylvie. She's her own character, and I, and I really like that. Moving on. She asks, again, where would he go? And Mobius toes the company line and says, I would want to be doing this job here with you. Renslayer says she heard from the timekeepers, and they want to oversee the pruning of Loki and Syl Sylvie. And they wanted him there. Um, him as in Mobius. So it's funny, Loki was seeking an audience with the timekeepers and Mobius was kind of dangling it in front of him and that wasn't even something he could make possible for himself. So uh, definitely while I do love um, Mobius Mobius, he wasn't completely honest uh, with Loki as, I, I don't know if, if we're led to believe or we all just kind of believe, to be honest. Um... Mobius then brings up C20 again. Of course, Renslayer just deflects it and tries to end the conversation. Mobius is starting to realize that things aren't right. So Renslayer spins this yarn about C20 and, and not wanting anything to happen to Mobius. And she asks if that's what he wanted to hear. When Mobius responds with, if it's the truth, she immediately responds with, You've been spending too much time with Lokis. And, you know, Mobius, of course, chuckles and agrees because at that point he's made a decision what he's about to do next. And it is very Loki. See what I did there? <laughs> um, now, there is one thing that Renslayer that doesn't line up with what Mobius told Loki. She said that both of them have seen all of existence. And that would mean that there is an end and the TVA can see it. Therefore, he would have um, technically lied to Loki because he said that no one knows the ending. And Renslayer looked Mobius in the eyes and said, you've seen it just like I have. So that's a little weird. Now, granted, that could just be like a turn of phrase that they've seen the expanse of known history, known knowledge, you know. Um, but maybe not. Um, a lot of times they choose to frame things in a specific way to get the desired questions asked or desired outcome now here is one of my nerd tween theories i think that kang was in love with her and she turned him down um for a reason and it doesn't really matter at this point what the reason was and i bet kang blames mobius and believes that the reason why she broke up with him or or didn't um, depending on how they do it, let him, you know, start dating him or anything like that was because of her friendship with Mobius, which I bet Kang doesn't think is a friendship. So how do you hurt someone the most? By destroying something they truly care about, something they dedicate their life to. What does Mobius care about more than anything? Well, besides jet skis. The TVA. But more on that later. Moby does his best Loki impression, acting extremely mischievous, 
and switching his temp pad with Renslayer's. And then we cut back to, C- to B-15 and Sylvie, as uh, we all would think, Sylvie thought as well, was that this was going to be a one-on-one showdown back at uh, Rock's Cart, where, they fir- where, where she first berm- bleh, first bombed the Sacred Timeline, and obviously where um, she uh, possessed her, her as in B-15. And all B-15 wants is the truth. So when Sylvie shows her, uh, and and side note, mad props to Wunmi Mosaka, uh, because hot damn, it felt I felt every little chill. Just when she said, I saw like like I, I just saw that I was happy. Man, well, I got chills. B fifteen says, I look happy. And she comes to after the vision and says, What now? So obviously there's going to be a plan afoot. Um then we cut back to Mobius watching the file on C twenty, um, because he has Renslayer's tempad, revealing that Renslayer was lying to him and during and, and she basically tells them that they're all variants and Excuse me. Damn. Even I'm boring myself. Maybe I should step it up. Um, we don't have too much longer to go. The episode's winding down already. So, um, where was I? Uh, la, 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 la. Okay. So, when Renslayer says she's going to end the video of C20, you can see her look back at the camera, and, and Mobius even zooms in, and it looks like just absolute fear. Mobius shows up in the time prison and tries to get a straight answer out of Loki, Um Mobius is frantic. He is rapidly coming to grips with everything. He's decided to trust Loki and that he loves Sylvie because that event could bring down the TVA, which might be his goal now. He even asked him to swear that Sylvie didn't implant those memories in C-20. Loki says, no, I believe her. And Mobius, being the wise man, basically had to talk himself into trusting two Lokis. And then, of course, we get a very um, not-so-subtle Lord of the Rings reference. Loki does his best Legolas impression and says, how about a friend? Mobius tells Loki, you are right. And they are going to have to trust each other to save her. And by her, I mean Sylvie. Um, When Loki agrees, Mobius says, you could be whoever, whatever you want to be, even someone good. I mean, just in case anyone ever told you different. Which is exactly what he told him. I think it was the last episode, but... When I saw that scene, I, I, I laughed, but instantly saw the foreshadowing of what was coming next. Um, when, when you watch as much cinema um, and break down as many movies as I have, you can kind of see um, the writing on the wall most times as to what's going to happen. Uh, Ren Slayer and a bunch of TVA guards are waiting outside the time prison. When o- Mobius asks what's wrong and gets nothing but silence, he kind of takes a moment, makes peace with what's about to happen. And then he goes on this rant. He says, you know where I want to go? Where it is I'm really from? Yeah, where I had a life before the TVA came along. Maybe I had a jet ski. That's what I would like to do. Just riding around on my jet ski. And with just two words, Rovana Renslayer may have just become the most hated person in the MCU. Prune him, and like she says, prune him. Why? Why? Now, think about this. We had to watch as he was disintegrated into nothing. Can you imagine how Loki would have felt there? Literally, everyone he ever cared about either died by his hand or actions, or just even being near him. Loki and Sylvie are led to the elevator that leads to the timekeepers. Sylvie, in a very un-Loki manner, asks if Loki is okay. Well, technically, it isn't that weird, because they got this weird variant dilemma, because they're actually two variants of the same being, so caring for the other is basically caring for yourself, so it's a... uh, I don't know. It's a brand new character, um, hold on, sorry, that can't be right. 
Oh, sorry. They, they are basically caring for themselves, so that's very on-brand for character. My bad. Um, the implication makes my head hurt, and, and as you can see, I just completely lost my whole mind right there reading a script because of that part. In the elevator, Sylvie asked if Renslayer remembered her, and she asked what the Nexus event was that caused all of this, which, as I mentioned before, might be her desire to help. Um, she was playing with, like, heroes and great warrior Valkyrie, and Lokis are supposed to be evil? I mean, technically. Um, so we really get to see the Timekeepers, and I'll be really honest, they look pretty cool. Um, the only thing is, I, I feel like the middle one didn't doesn't really look too much like the um the like the statues and the artwork that they have around so oh man i, I don't even know it, it feels like it ha oh man it has to be kang like really it has to be kang like how how i, I can't think of anyone else it could be <laughs> unless it's a, a a variant loki that already did take over the TV, tva I can see that happening. Um, but moving on. The timekeepers threaten the two of them, and, and Loki barks back. He's lost track of how many times he's been killed, so do your worst. And when the timekeepers say they are no threat, Sylvie snaps back and doubting that premise. The timekeepers say delete them and walk and in walks in. Wow. And walks in. B-15, to save the day, she releases Loki and Sylvie from their time callers uh, and says, for all time, before she throws Sylvie her sword. Now, I bet she actually believes that her actions are to protect the TVA because she can see that it's been corrupted. Also, for being as badass as she is, I, I like for the entire series, I don't understand why they, she was taken down so quick quickly. I mean, I, I get it for like pacing and for... Um, like getting your main character's most screen time. I, I get that, but yeah, it seems like you'd have her fighting in the background. I mean, that's not going to bother anyone. Um, but moving on. Loki and Sylvie um, fight off some Minutemen before Sylvie and Renslayer go head to head. So the upbringing of, of Loki and Sylvie is quite um, apparent by how they fight. Um, she is more skilled hand-to-hand -hand fighter than Loki is, and she's also more, a lot more brutal. Um, Loki would be the type to, like, like cut your leg and then talk shit, where this one's like, I, I'm just going to kill you, and it doesn't matter what the issue is. Now, if he had his magic, those Minutemen wouldn't have even stand a stood a chance at all, in my opinion. Um, and then after Sylvie just punches the ever-loving shit out of Renslayer, and Loki finishes dispatching, dispatching the other guards. He hands Sylvie back her sword, and, and while the timekeepers tried to talk their way out of it, Sylvie wasn't having it, and did that Darth Vader lightsaber throw, um, perfectly tossed, by the way, decapitating the one of the main, the main timekeeper who was sitting in the middle, and as his head rolls down the steps, the other two and the, the body of that one just start laughing. Like, hysterically, like, before they were shut down because it's revealed they were just mindless androids. So, what does that mean? Well, as many have probably postulated, all signs point to Kang, like I've been saying all episode and all, you know, forever pretty much. So, Loki will, from what I'm hearing, have a second season, which is apparently already be in the works. As we speak, so with the post credit scene, which we'll get into in a few minutes, stay with me, people. It, we're at the 44-minute mark, and I really appreciate it. Um, we're almost done, so I was able to get this whole breakdown in just about the time it would take to watch the episode. So you get all the little extra information with me, so you definitely want to you know, listen to this and then go watch the episode so you know what to look for. But moving on. So my nerd tween theory is, Hashtag nerd tween theory is Kang was one of the initial timekeepers. Um, he fell in love with Renslayer, who was just a hunter at the time. She rejected him, and he believes Mobius is to blame. So he is. So I think he killed the other timekeepers, seized con total control of the TVA, and as of now is seemingly the ultimate power and devoting 
everything in his life to her because as many of you know, Kang has many versions of himself all over the timelines. So I think he is the main villain, and most of us thought that Sylvie was the villain. Then we thought B-15 may be the villain. Then we thought the Timekeepers and Renslayer now. Now, Renslayer definitely deserves the title. I mean, how could she do that to Mobius? But we won't even see the villain until the, until the season finale, which I will expand on just a few minutes when we talk about the mid credit scene. Back to the heads rolling. Sylvie totally defeated when Loki shows her that it's an android. Loki says, then who created the TVA? And I think, like I said, I think it may it may have been a, the good version of Kang. Uh, for instance, a younger version who didn't want to become evil, Iron Lad, like I mentioned earlier. Just saying that'd be really cool. I like, think about Kang being a timekeeper and killing the other the others. It's just as, mo as, just as likely, though. Um... Or he could have just been a TVA uh, worker who discovered that they were all variants and decided to, you know, use his knowledge to take over the TVA himself. That could be another thing that happens. Um, Loki thinks back to what Mobius said. Their connection could bring down the TVA. Before he could tell her that he loves her, he is pruned in the back by Renslayer. And Sylvie disarms her. And instead of pruning her as she asks, she says, nah, -uh, you're going to tell me everything. Roll credits. Man, that's that. That's the this this series more so than even WandaVision, um, and definitely more than Falcon and the Winter Soldier. They're ending it on like they, they they've literally made like what appears like six short films that all tie in together because they're they just like are perfect in the like little block that they are. So. I mean, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> the mid credit scene, and now you now know why I was stuttering because of how just the, the implications of that mid credit scene. So we, you know, after he's pruned, we don't know what happened to him. We assume he's dead. Loki then wakes up and he asks if it's hell and if he's dead. Then Loki hears, not yet, but you will be unless you come with us. And then Loki looks up and the camera pans around to see four Loki variants. Boastful Loki, Alligator Loki, Kid Loki, and Classic Loki. And, and I, I tried to tell you, I tried to tell you Kid Loki was coming. Was I wrong? About him being the kid in the first episode? Sure. But I never committed to that being him. I said it could be. So call that a cop out if you will. I don't really care. I really hope all of you got that Thor 617 because uh, I told you to go get it. And I have two. So I'm set. If you're listening, you should be too. So back to this reveal, you know, in the background, you can see like this, this post-apocalyptic setting and there's a destroyed Avengers Tower. Um, so I, I have some nerd tween spec, uh, or more of like a, a dream of what I want to see. How cool would it be if an army of Lokis teamed up with an army of Mobiuses, Mobi? I don't know. Mobius, pl Mobius plural, and then fought like a giant army of Kangs. Like, obviously, I don't, I don't predict that happening in this season. But if there is a second season on the way, then I definitely could see that being the climax of that series. And you think about it this way. One of the reasons why Loki might be, like, in my opinion and a lot of people's opinion, significantly better than the other um, Marvel Disney Plus shows, the, the start of Phase 4, is because they, they kind of knew from the start that WandaVision was just going to be a one-off. Um, just because that story is done being told. Now, Wanda, Wanda could get her own uh, show or something like that later, but that WandaVision storyline is over. And I'm going to uh, uh, gonna slap a little um, WandaVision theory in here that I just freaking came up with the other day. We never saw um, the twins get uh, erased. We never saw that. It's definitely possible that um, Billy, right? Billy's the 
the, the one who's base is the young Wiccan could potentially have saved them by putting them in a, like a, a protective magical shell. So that could be it. That that could be how she heard them at the end of the the episode, uh, the end of the series of WandaVision. And did you know that they uh, apparently added Doctor Strange to the um, the final um, what you call it, the final uh, post credit scene of WandaVision? And you know it's really funny because I, I saw this leak like I don't know, probably about a month ago, and. and I didn't discredit it, but I, I just – it was just too flimsy for me to run on, um, and I'm mad I didn't run on it. But I, I, there's no way anyone would believe it was real because um, even when people like uh, comicbook.com were posting it, 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 it didn't have the best quality. So um, it, it, imagine what it was from a leak, not from literal HD film – HD phones or an uh, actual screen grab. So – I mean, Loki, um, Tom Hiddleston's been on record saying that his favorite two episodes were the last two. So um, I really think we're in for a treat. And uh, I, I can't wait to see how this the rest of the story plays out. Um, but, man, with the way that I usually do these breakdowns, to be at 51 minutes um, and having the whole breakdown done, I, I'm shocked. Uh, but... Thank you all for coming today and hanging with me for about an hour. Um, I definitely want you guys to go check out my other content that's on YouTube. Um, as I keep saying, and I will eventually get it done, um, all interviews that have been done in the last month um, are not on the uh, Spotify's and iHeart's. They're only on YouTube. Um, I did some great interviews with like Noah's from Noah's Amazing Reviews, um, the people from Whatnot Comics, um, as well as the um wow i did an interview with ryan and dito and i just did a few hours ago uh, which will also be posted at some point today the an interview with with um Ilis Umanati, who is a fantastic uh rapper and cover artist and he just got his first um title with boom um that will that released today actually and technically by the time i record this it's tomorrow <laughs> but but um yeah, it's definitely um, definitely going to want to check that out because if um, you haven't checked out the YouTube, you're, you're missing out on a lot of stuff that I have been doing up there. And might be one of the reasons why uh, you, you uh, aren't one of my super fans yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely check out that interview. Um with Illus Illuminati and, you know, of course, Ario and everyone else that I've done interviews with. And thank you so much for watching um, or listening, technically, because this will be an audio presentation. Um, and like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this is Nerdpool Prime, signing off. <laughs>